They do it because they want to be cooperative with their fellow human beings. And you want to create an educational system, again education again, which marries manual labor and intellectual labor and fosters cooperation. All, all the anarchists would say that in one way or another, I would have thought. So that's, that's anarcho-communism, a communist economy married to a voluntary nature of communism, not forced communism, and not based on the state. And he said, where, where is this communism? You know, what are you talking about, Kropotkin? Uh, well, he looks at these tribes in Siberia, but even in the modern world, he had this idea, for instance, he had this wonderful example, the very Victorian, of the Royal Lifeboat Society being an example of the communist ethic. Because think about it for a minute. Who funds this thing? The Royal Life, it's just based on donations, right? And people, and what happens in the world? People cast themselves into boats into stormy seas to save strangers. They're not paid to do it, and they do it. Why do they do it? And they do it because they feel a fellow feeling for their fellow human beings, right? This is an example of a radical version of the big society. I've argued with people in the last few weeks that you shouldn't poo-poo the big society. You should run with it and say to David Cameron, I know what the big society is. Read Kropotkin, that's the big society. But you have to think, you can't just mutualize the welfare state, you've got to mutualize the banks too. <laughs> you, you can't stop at one, one sector. And um, you know, I think a lot of anarchists in the 19th century would say, yeah, big society, that's a good idea. But you know, don't stop with uh, the things you don't like, just continue to the things you, know, that you, that you have special interest in, which is the other side. You know, don't just mutualize the East End, mutualize the West End. You know, um, then, then we're getting somewhere. But I think it will be an interesting argument, you know, an intellectual argument. I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm surprised that the left in this country, though there are some people on the left who are talking about engaging in it, have just, you know, their, their argument, oh, this is just stupid, no one understands what he's talking about. I would take it the other way around. So I guess I understand completely what you're talking about, but you're, you're just staying at half, you know, half, it's only a half glass. Let's fill up the glass. Isn't Cameron just like, you sort of like stealing the less welcome and using, like, Kind of like socialist ideas and excuses all about the state. So That's right. Not socialist, but sort of anarchist in a way, saying that the you know the people should be able to flourish. And that, this is what Kropotkin is saying. The big society for him was the lifeboat association. Not you know, he was saying the whole country should be the lifeboat association. The whole basis of the economy of politics should be based on the virtues of the lifeboat society. But you don't. Therefore, you don't need banks and you don't need the state. You need an army. That's where it's quite different than Mr. Cameron's ideas, which, again, is used, as, I think, for opportunist reasons. But, you know, who cares? You, you're, that's, what, that's what political argument is about, as you probably realize. You turn arguments around and use them for your own, your own uh, benefit. Anyway, that's anarcho-communism. And anarcho-communism became the big ideology for, um, for anarchists from the 1880s to the 1940s, like in the Spanish movement. There was a big dispute in Spain between collectivists and communists, but the communists eventually win one out. So, so you, you don't see communists as a, a form, of, like a subgroup of collectivists? Well, because it, in a, in a, in a, they didn't. They didn't. Yeah. They really fought with each other. I mean, right. sometimes physically, you know. And, 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 and it's saying that this kind of he who works eats is the dividing, Collective. Is the dividing line between the... In, in simple yeah, terms, in simple terms it would be. Yes, I think so. Yeah. The, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, but if you think communists. of Kropotkin's idea... You know, it's almost, almost deeply religious what he's saying. You know, we have to have this... You know, it is, I mean, there is kind of, again, this pre-anarchist form of communism, which you'll find in lots of religions. Again, the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, there are radical socialist uh, uh, Christians who've used the Sermon on the Mount as, you know, Jesus Christ was a carpenter, you know. You know, he drove the rich out of the temple. I mean, uh, he, there's a whole history. Tolstoy, of course, is an example of a Christian, of a Christian anarchist. I said before that you couldn't have, you know, that there's religion, you have to have a secular society. That doesn't mean you can't have religious people in the secular society. What I'm saying is that when you have modern day anarchism, you have to have the idea of a secular society. People didn't think about it. The secular society didn't exist in people's minds unless you were completely crazy or really out of the, until the 18th, 17th, 18th century. You know, just nowhere in the world did people think in terms of the secular and, and the religious. It, everything was religious, you know, in one way or another. Anywhere in the world. Um, so, the final kind of anarchism is a thing called syndicalism, anarcho-syndicalism, which is a take on Proudhon in the way Proudhon talks about this to some extent. Uh, I'll conclude. I think. Uh, 
syndicalism. It's all, um, well, I don't think you have one of these. You don't have enough of them, but if, uh, you'll have to photocopy it from the other people. Uh, finally, syndicalism is what Proudhon was talking about, which is that society is based on workshops, right? Uh, in other words, it's very productive. It goes back to he who doesn't produce, doesn't eat, in this case. So you're in a society now going from small shops, um, small workshops, to large factories, or you're in a society in the late 19th, early 20th century with lots of people gathered together working together in shipyards, maybe working as landless laborers in parts of the world, take, bringing crops, building railways, um, running ship lines, um, you know, working in big textile mills. And the syndicalism was the idea that you take the reformist trade unions that are within the system and you say, not only do you want better wages, right, and better working conditions and holidays and all the rest of it, and the right to have trade unions, we want to use those structures to become the basis of all of society, right? But the structures of modern day society for them, in let's say 1900, would be based on structures at the workplace. So teachers would organize, for instance, here, you would have a you know, cooperative, the teachers union would control the school, and you would organize it democratically. Um, you would elect your principal, right? Uh, and you'd run the school that way. The thing about syndicalism, by the way, that's a weak point, is it usually thought about productive labor, not intellectual labor, as and this odd description. So really, when you think about the syndicalists, where they're powerful, is in certain kinds of industries. Even in this country, syndicalism was important in the coal mines in Wales before the First World War. So places like that where hundreds of thousands of people all of a sudden squeeze together in valleys, and all they do is bring out coal, and, and that's all they do all day, and, and the entire economy is surrounded with this. This creates real tensions, you know, class struggle, and these people, in a way, are close to the Marxists, but what they say, the difference from the Marxists, Marx has slogans to close this syndicalism. They say, we don't need a state. Right? You don't need a state. You don't need a Marxist party. What you need is a federation, and this comes from federations, and the Proudhon talks about the organization federation as opposed to a state of trade unions. And there's a variation on this called council communism, which is close to um, syndicalism in the First World War. That's what, the, what happened in Russia. You know, Soviet, Soviet Union. Soviet means council, that's all it means, a union of, So on um, the people that launched the Russian Revolution in 1905 and even 1917, they weren't the Bolsheviks, they actually weren't political, but what they did do was create these councils, right? In factories, in the army, that's why you have a revolution, uh, and even to some extent in the countryside, they're weak in the countryside. And they said, we will have all these things run democratically, no more officers, no more bosses, and all the rest of it. It didn't last. The Bolshevik Party took it over. But that's an example of Russian, the Russian form of this, a kind of a narco communism, which the Bolsheviks take over, the Russian communists take over, and create a dictatorship out of it. So these, uh, these isms, these, these are the forms of ism. You can see what differentiates them is the way they organize society, you know, the way they organize themselves, and the kind of economy they want. You know? But all of them share two things. One, they don't want a state, right? And two, no matter how collective or communistic they are, it's voluntary. So that means that it's based, I mean, at least theoretically it's voluntary. So it's based on consensus. It's not based on being forced to be free, as Rousseau said. And it, theoretically, it means that the individual could opt out of it. So either if you're an anarcho-individualist or an anarcho-communist, what the anarcho-communists would say is that to create a true social individual, right, you have to work together voluntarily in a collective. But that will create a full personality. And the individualists would say, in order to have a social personality, you have to, you have to strip yourself of all the illusions, uh, the mind games of uh, human discourse. But not, not live like Robinson Crusoe on a lone island. Actually, Robinson Crusoe did live by himself. He had somebody else with him. Always forget about it. Friday, there were two of them living together. Um, um, you know, you you don't uh, you, individualists don't live you know in a cave by themselves. They just believe that they have. They believe they're very suspicious of any kind of ideology, even something called anarchism. 
and they believe that as a group of people who are conscious of these dodgers, they can create a complete social individual, right? But all of them are, and their two aims is a stateless society, a society of empowered individuals through education and some sort of organization uh, at the end of the day. And that, that, that's the classical anarchists. Uh, and finally, these movements grew quite large at certain points. I mean, uh, from, let's say, the 1860s and 1940, if you include these syndicalists, uh, they were even important in Britain, you know, uh, in the do dockers, the miners, and many other unions before 1914. Um, in Russia, I said, in Italy, in Spain, uh, in South America, they were very important in Argentina, in Brazil, in Peru. And in the United States, believe it or not, there was an organization called the Industrial Workers of the World, which was a syndicalist organization, which was quite effective amongst poorer workers, the workers who got the worst deal, and mainly immigrant workers. Um, and there were lots of immigrants from the United States. And as I said, in China, Japan, many of the early communist parties of the 1920s and 30s, many of the first communists jumped ship from syndicalism or anarchism in the 1920s and 30s, because many of them were not so deeply ideological. They didn't really care about the stateless society. They wanted to have the most radical form of socialism. And they saw in the Soviet Union, they might be mistaken, that dream come true. So, you know, lots of them became communists. But they fed off the energy of these anarchist and syndicalist uh, movements. And I said the last big movement was in Spain. And that lasted until the 1930s, right? Uh, read George Orwell's account homage to Catalonia. Now, you know, you think about these people being utopians, you know, living, you know, maybe in small villages, and some Spanish anarchists certainly did. But it, bear in mind, in 1936 and 1937, the anarcho-syndicalist organization and the anarchists, the CNT-5, controlled Barcelona, which was the most advanced industrial city in Spain, right, and one of the most advanced industrial cities in the Mediterranean. So um, it's not true that they couldn't do that. The problem for these people is who's going to support anarchists, right? And this is an example. They get squeezed. In the, in the land of isms, in the world of isms in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, communism, fascism, you know, they get squeezed from both ends. That's what happens in Spain. You know, the Russians give the communists and the socialists weapons, and the Nazis uh, and the Italians give the fascists, or whatever you want to call them, the uh, Franco's forces weapons. But no one's going to fund, give tanks to anarchists, right? Um, so they get squeezed out. And so after 1945, I told you it was a different kind of anarchism. It's got nothing to do with, although we might say some of it still exists in the third world or the global south. Some people would argue that it's been revived again in South America and Bolivia and places like that, in parts of Mexico. Uh, nevertheless, the big movement, if you think about global, anti-global movements and social movements of today, and these people you see marching at your student demonstrations, who are these people? They're mostly students, right? Uh, or intellectuals or middle class people, you know? There are very few anarchists anymore who are artisans or steel workers or peasants, at least in the Western world, you know? So it's a different kind of movement. It's a kind of lifestyle movement, right, about culture. You There's know. a lot of anarchist squatters. Squatters, but who are these squatters? They're working class people. They're not close down Well, yeah, that's true. I agree with that. Yeah, lots of them are, yeah. Um, as I said, I mean, this is a model, but I mean, nevertheless, it's a very different kind of movement than you had uh, 